Thank you very much, Stephen. I'm very pleased to be here at the Thinking Out of the Box conference. And actually, Future ICT is a project that strives to think out of the box. It's a response to the European flagship call, which is a competition for 1 billion euros, actually a project for a 10 years time period. And Future ICT in particular wants to produce new science and technology to understand and manage our complex world in a more sustainable and resilient way. We're often saying that we're living in an information age. But what does that mean? Well, we have created actually the most complex artifact ever with our ICT systems. They incorporate billions of components, actually. That means computers, smartphones, people, factories, cars and all of them somehow are interacting with each other. Moreover, these systems are turning more and more into artificial social systems because some of those systems, just take financial trading, are actually making a picture of the surrounding world, try to extrapolate into the future, communicate with other systems, and take autonomous decisions. Yes, more than 50% of trading decisions are actually taken by computers today. Now, that also implies that we need to understand these systems better because we know that in social systems there are a number of problems such as coordination failures, breakdowns of cooperation, conflicts, wars, crime, and all this. So if we don't take care, we'll have the same problems in those information communication systems and in the systems that compo are composed of both society and ICT. So we need to have a better social science understanding. The ICT systems we've created, in some sense, have created too much data, too much speed, and too much complexity. So ICT is actually part of the problem that we're facing today in our society, but also it's key to the solution. Sandy Pendland of MIT Media Lab says, our fin financial transport and health systems are broken. I guess many people feel like that. And uh, the question is, what can we do about it? We believe we need a paradigm shift. We need to change our thinking about our systems. The more complex our systems become, the more do we need a decentralized management concept based on facilitating favorable self-organization. And that requires real-time data to allow for flexible, adaptive response. We have networked our world. In the past 30 years or even more, we have established a global exchange of people, money, goods, information, and ideas. So globalization and technological change have created a strongly coupled and interdependent world. It came with many new services and opportunities, actually. So we all appreciate that. But on the other hand, this network infrastructure also creates pathways for disaster spreading. And I want to illustrate that a little bit by an experiment that should stimulate your imagination. This experiment shows table tennis balls lying on mouse traps, and we'll disturb it just in one place. That means we'll drop another table tennis ball and we'll see what happens. So that should have come actually with uh, some noise, but anyway. Um, so what you see is actually that the table tennis ball that had caused a local perturbation messed up the whole system, in some sense the whole world, to speak metaphorically. And you want to see it again? Okay, and get it. I guess that sounds much more dangerous. Um, all right, um, so this is a prime example of a cascading effect, obviously. Unfortunately, in our world, we're seeing many cascading effects. It's also the example to illustrate, actually, chain reactions in uh, nuclear reactions. So 
We know that uh, nuclear reactions at power stations are hard to control, sometimes get out of control. And then the question really is, if we have created so many strongly coupled systems in our world, have we incidentally, without knowing, created a global time bomb? When I first had this idea, I was actually shocked. My brain didn't want to think this idea. Yeah? But then I was so much impressed actually by the implications of it that I thought, okay, I have to follow it on. And I was searching on the web and I was finding this quote by Warren Buffett, one of the richest men on earth. So he must know how the world works, at least part of it. And he said, actually, that we are creating financial weapons of mass destruction. He was warning of an investment time bomb. And um, he said also that growing trade in derivatives poses a mega catastrophic risk for the economy. That's what he said in 2003. And it took another five years until this investment time bomb exploded. So we probably have created these global time bombs without knowing. Here is an example that shows you that the uh, financial market can be quite unstable. On May 6, 2010, we had the so-called flash crash. That flash crash evaporated $600 billion within just 20 minutes. And solid assets turned into penny stocks within just minutes. Well, in the beginning, people saw that was a criminal act, or it was an error. Somebody had a fat finger. It took more than half a year, actually, to analyze the situation. It turned out it was not a criminal act. It was not an error. It was an interaction effect. And it could happen again, probably. Actually, it did happen again, just not to that extent. Of course, now the trading systems have been changed in order, hopefully, to, to stop these things happening. But this shows you certainly that the interaction of many well-functioning components in a bigger system can create very unexpected and also dangerous effects. Here is a video which illustrates actually the same thing that I've shown you with table tennis balls for the global banking system here for the US in particular. And you can see that basically since Lehman Brothers default, we have also these cascading effects in the banking system, much more serious, of course, because hundreds of banks have been dying in the meantime and has caused hundreds of billions of losses. So we certainly need to understand those cascading effects much better. Of course, cascading effects in different systems are not just the same. They may have different characteristics and we need to learn about it. That requires a lot of data. So blackouts and electrical power grids is just another example that shows you the complexity of the dynamics that comes out from such cascading effects or revolutions. In the political arena, that is, again, another cascading effect. And we've seen it also in Europe when it turned into democracies. It turns out that we don't have the science to understand our globalized world. For 30 years or so, we have globalized our world. We have pushed for technological revolutions. But the global system science to understand the resulting complex systems is still lacking. We need to have a new science of systemic risks. We need to push complex system theory towards practical relevance. And that requires a lot of data, a hell of a lot of data, actually. So we need a new data science, but that data science should not just count bits and bytes. We need to understand what is really the relevant information, what is the game-changing information, what information will make it into history books, and what are the 99.99999% of information which is unimportant or useless. And further on, we have to learn how to do integrated systems design that ensures not, not just the components work well, but the whole system made up of interacting components. 
Over the time of the project, we discovered that it was not enough actually to fill knowledge gaps. We learned that we need to change our way of thinking. And our thinking determines what we see actually. That means our brain doesn't allow us to see everything. So just take this cat over here. This poor cat in her life has seen just vertical bars all the time. So she knows the vertical world and is reasonably happy over there. Now let's assume that after some time we put that cat into another world with horizontal bars. I won't be able actually to see those bars because the cognition has not been developed for this. And in the same way, we need to overcome the limitations of our conventional thinking. I'm just showing you one example from my own work where I've experienced it myself. After I discuss this example of Galilei. And uh, actually, I'd like to ask Stephen to come on stage in order to demonstrate an experiment. So first of all, I'd like to know who thinks that those two objects are falling at the same speed to the ground if we drop them at the same time. So who thinks <laughs> coming down at the same time? Nobody? Come on. <laughs> so you didn't have any physics? Siegfried Grossman, maybe? No? <laughs> um, who thinks this one will be falling faster? Think out of the box, come on. <laughs> Who thinks this will, will be faster? All right. I don't see all hands, by the way. OK, let's make this experiment. Three, two, one, zero. Hmm. All right, so it's a very intelligent audience, obviously. <laughs> now, but why did uh, Galileo Galilei claim that two different objects like those over there would fall at the same speed. And why was it so important that he was put to prison and it took 350 years until the Catholic Church actually apologized for that? Well, let's make another experiment then. So now we'll put this on top of the other object over here, so it's, it's loose, it's not fixed. Uh, let's do three, two, one, zero. Wow, Stephen, you should have learned physics rather than mathematics. Okay, so you have talent. And uh, please thank Stephen for this wonderful experiment. And it shows you that Galileo was able to see beyond what our senses tell us. He could abstract the things. He could abstract, in this case, from air resistance to see that there was something that was true for all objects, actually. And this discovery really was essential for physics. It was kind of the start of modern physics. And now we can shoot satellites in the universe and do many other things. So that really was a turning point. And it changed our perspective from a geocentric worldview to a heliocentric worldview. Now, I was promising you some discoveries that I made some time ago. So when I was still in Göttingen, led by diplomacies about pedestrians, I took some video recordings of people and then when I play, played that at normal speed, there was nothing interesting. However, when I played it at faster speed, then I discovered something. There was a hidden order within the pedestrian crowds. You can see there's these lanes forming. The different directions of motion are separating from each other, and people almost never have to stop. So it's like magic, like an invisible hand of self-organization 
maybe you could even call it collective intelligence, and people didn't see it. So when I started this kind of research, people found it funny. And took another 10 years until people discovered the importance of it and it became a big, big research field with scientists all over the world studying self-organization pedestrian crowds. But we also discovered that this invisible hand kind of magic self-organization, this didn't always lead to good results. It could happen that we had these intermittent outflow. When people are trying to rush towards the door, pushing, you see the outflow can stop. That means there is an inefficiency that uh, comes from conflicts of use. And we call this the faster is slower effect, or the slower is uh, faster effect. And that can be actually applied to many more situations. It occurs in many transportation systems, in many production systems, logistics systems, administration, and so on. Let me show you one example. So at that time I was professor in Dresden, where Infineon has a factory, and they produce the most modern computer chips you can imagine. So a completely, a very complex um, production process, one of the most modern factories in the world but they had a problem with their logistics. So this is a particular production machine which is called a wet bench. And there are kind of different chemicals through which the silicon wafers have to go in order to produce finally the computer chips. Now in order to speed up the process and have a higher throughput, they were first of all measuring the performance for different parameter combinations. And then they were trying to interpolate actually between the measurement points in order to identify the optimum production parameters. But what you can see over here is there's a huge sensitivity actually to parameter changes and the predictability of the performance for those interpolated data points that was very low. But this low level of predictability is quite typical for complex systems. Another thing is that in order to improve the throughput, they were trying to make the treatment times in these chemical buses as short as possible. But it turned out that didn't work well. And they were very unhappy actually with the performance of their machines. And then I had to look at this and said, well, why don't you do the opposite? slow down the processes, apply the slower is faster effect, extend the treatment times, but in a way that allows you to harmonize the different treatment steps. And see, a miracle of Dresden happened. So we increased the throughput by this slower is faster effect by more than 30%. This is really enormous. And one of these machines costs more than a million euros. So. This is how fast you can save a lot of money. But it's not the only problem that we have actually in production systems and in our economy. There is a very nice experiment which is called the beer game, which you can play with anybody, with uh, people who are first semester economic students or physics students, with managers or with anybody. And it turns out that in this uh, production chain where the beer is produced and there are some wholesalers and distributors in between uh, until it finally reaches the consumer, there is a problem. If uh, it's sunny tomorrow, then there will be a lot of requests. There will be a lot of demand actually for more beer. If it's raining, then of course there's less requests. That means demand is largely fluctuating. And these perturbations, that basically produce a bullwhip effect. That means they increase from one step to the next one. And it turns out that those managers end up with either full stocks or no beer at all. That means the nightmare happens. And why is that? 
because the system behaves in an unstable way. It's uncontrollable. Here's a very good example really to demonstrate that. So it's an experiment with many cars driving in a circle and drivers are instructed to move continuously and not to stop, but to avoid accidents, of course. And we'll see after some time there's a perturbation and that perturbation is growing and actually a traffic jam is formed. So now every car is stopped, the traffic jam is moving backward. And now the question is, why is this happening? Yeah. If you would ask drivers, they would say, well, there was a stupid driver in front of me who didn't know how to drive a car. But in fact, there is something else here. It's a systemic instability. And despite best efforts of everybody, the system fails. Yeah? And this is actually happening not only in traffic situations. It's happening also during crowd disasters where nobody wants to do any harm to anybody else, but in the end, many people are killed, as it happened during the Love Parade disaster in Duisburg. That is shocking. How is it possible that systems fail in such a way? And my personal understanding is that also revolutions and wars, for example, are the same kind of phenomenon. It's a systemic instability, and that's why those systems get out of control. The same thing happened also to our financial system, so we need to understand those instabilities. I got more and more interested in strongly coupled systems. Strongly coupled systems behave in a different way from loosely coupled. Loosely coupled systems are characterized basically by the properties of their components. But in strongly coupled systems, self-organization takes over. Emergent and sometimes quite counterintuitive system behaviors come up. Unwanted feedback effects, cascading effects, side effects. Predictability and controllability goes down. And we have increased frequency of ex extreme events. So that really requires to change our way of thinking about those systems. We need to change our view from a component-oriented to an interaction-oriented view. And I think this is really difficult for many people because we usually don't see the interactions. We see the components. Very difficult to understand those interactions and the effects of them. In order to understand this, we need to create new instruments to explore the world. And Future ICT is going to do that. Future ICT is going to bring together data with models and people. We'll create systems to sense and understand, to turn data into information and answer what is the state of the world questions. Not only the physical state, also the social and economic state. You want to understand social capital, the social fabric, what we need to protect, actually. We also want to understand, actually, the implications of our decisions and actions. So we want to study what-if scenarios. For that, we need to develop models to simulate and predict. And those systems should turn information into knowledge. And finally, we also want to turn knowledge into wisdom. What are we doing this for? We're doing it for the people. So we are building those systems for the people. We are building platforms to explore and interact. I want to explain it now in more detail. We also need to have an innovation accelerator, actually, to make progress at the speed that uh, we are facing new challenges in our world. Now, the trick is that we want to bring together different kinds of sciences that have been working in separation in the past. First of all, of course, the classical disciplines, uh, humanities, qualitative, sociology, quantitative sociology, and economics. But complexity science is really crucial here to get a systemic understanding. And now there is computational social science that will be needed to build the living Earth simulator, which I'm going to explain in a minute. 
and uh, data science, which is connected somehow to the planetary nervous system, which I'm also going to explain in a moment, and crowdsourcing. So there are new scientific opportunities out here, and we should combine them, actually, to create synergy effects. So let me start with the planetary nervous system. How can we imagine it? Well, basically, we would collect data all over the world and put it together. Actually, this is happening. The internet is doing it for us in some sense. And here I'm demonstrating to you how this can be used actually to create a picture of the Colosseum in Rome or any other tourist site in the world. We don't even have to travel there. So this shows you over here where the different photographers have been standing who took the pictures and uploaded them to Flickr. And then all those Flickr photos can be put together in order to create this impressive 3D reconstruction of the Coliseum. So basically, the data that is out there is enough to reconstruct a big part of our world. <coughs> well, we are also using smartphones a lot today. And smartphones can be used as another device, actually, to collect information for us. Of course, it's very important that we do it in a privacy-respecting way, that uh, individuals have control over their own data, and that uh, they basically share the benefit of sharing data with others. So that requires new technologies, but in principle, that will allow us um, to create a planetary nervous system which uh, allows us to measure the social footprint, but also to create awareness. Awareness is very important uh, to avoid mistakes and also to discover new opportunities. And it's important also to create better compasses for decision makers. So today we're still very much oriented at the GDP per capita, but we know it's not a good compass. We should consider more variables of health, of environment, social well-being, and so on. And that also will help us to promote sustainability in systems. But first of all, we need to learn how to measure that in an efficient way, if possible, in real time and globally. Now, going one step beyond this, we can create a living Earth simulator. So that requires us to integrate different kinds of data, demographic data, transport data, geographic data, but also different kinds of models. So such as contact network models, multi-scale models, agent-based models, and so on. And uh, with this, then it becomes possible to do large-scale simulations these need to be validated, but we could look at uh, what-if scenarios. And here's an example, actually. Um, Alex Vespignani has been involved here in uh, Vittoria Kolitsa and shows you the spreading of epidemics. Now, that requires, that requires not only, actually, requires not only uh, epidemic spreading data, but it also requires transportation data. So you can see over here data of the airline network that is really crucial for the spreading of diseases. Now these kind of simulations are used today actually to respond to crisis scenarios and figure out what are the best ways to take action. Now, today we have quite a few models about social and economic behavior. We have uh, traffic models, we have production models, we have uh, models for crowd behavior, social cooperation, social norms, conflict, crime, war, and so on and so on. So basically now we would have to integrate it and scale it up to global scale. We also need to increase the degree of detail, the accuracy, and this way, eventually, we'll be able to come up with a simulation that eventually becomes more and more useful. 
But it's not enough, of course, to understand the problems better. We also need to learn how to manage complexity. And after all the examples that I've shown before, the question arises, is it the last battle? Well, no, I would say, but we need to really change our way of thinking. Look, this is a classical airplane, and it's constructed for stable flight. See this uh, picture of this fighter plane over here? It has its wings going forward rather than backward. This has been created for unstable flight. So if somebody is shooting a rocket at this plane, you turn off the control and it does something crazy in order to avoid being hit. And it couldn't fly stably without a steady adaptive control. So it's a completely different concept over here. If you're using a Segway to explore a city that also is based on an unstable system that is steadily stabilized all the time. So flexibility is important, and for this we need to have a decentralized approach. So how to use properties of complex systems? Basically, well, if they tend to self-organize, couldn't we use this tendency to reach what we want? rather than fighting self-organization in our systems. We just have to choose the interactions in the right way. And that is the trick. The interactions can be the problems, such as in this case, where we find stop-and-go waves. As we find them today, and they're annoying us every day, but also, we can overcome this by changing the interactions. So I have a wonderful car. Of course, I can leave the freeway by turning this car into a helicopter. I can sell it to you if you want. And uh, this allows me actually to see what is the reason for these stop and go waves. And it turns out that it's those cars that are trying to get into the freeway that are producing perturbations. And those perturbations increase due to the instability of traffic flow, we get stop and go traffic. Now we are accelerating the visualization, but the inflow stays the same. And we are turning on a traffic assistance system in a few seconds, which is changing the interactions of the cars. Of course, it has a radar sensor. The radar sensor measures the distance and relative velocity allows the car to automatically change its acceleration, deceleration. And see, we got rid of stop and go traffic. So we could stabilize traffic flow, we could increase capacity. Well, that's fantastic. Couldn't we use the same principle for other systems? And in fact, we can. We can create smarter cities where we can reduce travel times for public transport, for car drivers, for pedestrians and cyclists, and it's good for environment as well. So we can make more out of scarce resources if we learn how these system components interact and what are the implications. And we can make mass events much safer and avoid crowd disasters by this more fundamental understanding of the system dynamics. We have also now models that allow us to understand conflict. And uh, that allows us to compare different scenarios political scenarios under discussion and see what are the scenarios that are likely to produce more or less conflict. Okay, and finally, we want to open this up for everybody. We want to create platforms for everyone. And um, that is actually a challenge in itself because it comes down to creating a new public good. And we know that public goods are in a danger of showing tragedies of the commons. So there could be data pollution, data manipulation, misuse, privacy intrusion, cybercrime, and all this. So how to promote responsible use? This is really a very difficult scientific challenge that needs to be solved in order to be able to open up data and models for everybody. But then we will be able to support decision making, we'll be able uh, to provide a modeling suit for everybody, and also to create interactive virtual worlds to explore possible futures, actually. And in fact, we can build new worlds on the web 
with uh, different decision rules, different financial systems, different intellectual property rights, and so on. So information communication systems open up completely new opportunities for creativity, but also for business. And um, how do you want to promote innovation within our system and our project? Well, the idea is that we need to have some fixed stars for people to orient at. And these are what we call our Hilbert questions, really difficult scientific challenges, difficult questions to go for. And uh, we are formulating them, and then there's a competition to solve these problems. And uh, we expect that in the end there will be actually many new opportunities coming up from this, including, for example, social inspired information and communication technologies. We will be able to create collective awareness, social adaptiveness, social inspired self organization. And in fact, social systems have many interesting features to learn from under the right conditions. Cooperation emerges, self regulation, conflict resolution, resilience, trust, reputation, social norms, values, ethics, and culture. So, if we learn how this works, actually, we can create better systems, such as a trustable web. We also hope we will be able to create a better financial system eventually, what we call social money, money with a memory, with a reputation. But there is a challenge of innovation. So basically, turning ideas into something which will change the world is really difficult. In the beginning, people say, it's completely impossible. And then eventually, after many years, they say, OK, it's possible, but it's not worth doing. And finally, they said, I said it was a good idea all along. And uh, somewhere on my hard disk, I still have an unpublished paper which I somehow forgot to send out. <laughs> so it turns out that everybody wants to be the person who had the idea first, and uh, those people who really had to fight for the idea are forgotten over time, which also Alexander von Humboldt actually pointed out. But the most difficult thing really is to come up with an invention in the first place, to see things that other people don't see. And many of the social features are actually of this kind, social norms and culture. These are, in some sense, largely invisible to us, and large, uh, very difficult to quantify, very difficult to understand, and on the other hand, also quite vulnerable. So we need to see behind our visible world, the components of our world. We need to understand interactions. And in order really to understand it, we need to stop searching where the light is. So you probably know this joke where somebody is asking somebody else, who's searching something on the ground, and is asking, OK, what are you looking for? There's nothing here. And he says, I'm looking for a $100 uh, dollar note. And then the question is, why are you looking for it here? Because there is where the light is. OK, so we really need to stop searching for the light. Is we need to do the difficult tour. And please don't forget, we have to break through the barriers of our thinking. 